So let's go ahead and, and jump in. A uh, fair amount to cover tonight. That some of it should be fun. We're going to look at control blocks, otherwise known as program flow control. Uh, start with an analogy. Uh, when you make everyday decisions, sometimes you're using logic. If it's raining, then take a raincoat. If it's snowing, wear a heavy coat and gloves. Else, wear a light jacket. If you're driving down a road, if the street name is Elm, maybe this is the place you turn left. Or if you're in a traffic circle, keep going around until you see the proper exit road. So we'll see some of these ideas of uh, making the having the program make decisions based on the criteria that the team member makes when they write the code. And uh, right, see how, how the robot is making decisions. <laughs> so we'll look at a variety of different uh, constructs, um, wait for a certain amount of time, wait until a certain condition occurs. If a uh, condition is true, then do this. If a condition is true, then do this. Else, uh, re repeat a series of, uh, of blocks a certain number of times, repeat a series of blocks until a certain condition occurs, repeat a, a series of blocks forever with uh, the exception that there's a way of stopping it, which is the last thing on the list. <clears throat> so the block that, that waits for a selected number of seconds uh, is at the top, uh, wait one second, you can change of course the number of seconds. That causes the program to wait. If you've given the robot something to do, like uh, start moving, it will continue to do that while the program waits. Uh, that's a little counterintuitive. It takes some getting used to. Uh, later, we're gonna talk about loops. Essentially, a wait is a real simple loop where the program does nothing while it's looping. Um, similarly, wait until um, causes the program to wait until a condition before it goes on to the next block, which is similar to when we see, see a repeat until, except a repeat allows us to say what we want to do while we're looping. The wait until implicitly says the program is not going to do anything until the condition is true, uh, and then it'll go on to the next block. That'll make more sense when I give you some examples. So here's an example. At the top, we set the movement uh, speed to 20%. We tell the program that we've connected our motors to B and C. Uh, we say that the uh, motor rotation, one motor rotation is equivalent to three inches moved. And we tell it to start moving. We wait for 5.5 seconds. That's the program that's waiting. The robot is still moving straight ahead. And then we tell, uh, after that 5.5 second wait, we tell the robot to stop moving. Then for some reason, we have the program just wait for 10 seconds. Robot's not doing anything, not sure why. And then we change the movement speed to 40%. Then we tell the robot to move uh, right, uh, a 60% turn, that's not a turn in place. And then we tell it to do a turn in place for one second. And then we tell it to start moving. And then we tell it to wait until the color sensor connected to A um, detects black. And then there's more blocks we can't see on the screen. So it's a, a sequence of things that we tell the robot to do based on certain conditions, based on time, et cetera. And um, we'll, we'll demonstrate some actual programs in a few minutes. So loops are an important uh, concept in programming. In the uh, scratch environment, they're normally called repeat, uh, or we can call them repeat loops. There's also the wait that I mentioned, which is an implicit uh, loop. And there's a special type of loop that's called forever that 
sort of loops forever until you tell it to stop. So at the top here, we have repeat 10 times, and we would put something inside there to do normally. We don't absolutely have to do, do so, uh, but usually we would have a reason to do something 10 times, and we would tell it what, that, what, what those things were, and would do them 10 times. We could change it, of course, to two times or 100 times or 1,000 times, depending on what it is we're, we're trying to get done. I mentioned there's a forever thing that's uh, short for repeat forever, and it will repeat the blocks um, that you plug into it forever unless you use a stop block, which is a bit tricky, um, but we'll see a couple of different ways of doing that. So let's examine what this program does. Again, we start by setting the movement speed. We tell it uh, where we've plugged in the drive motors, uh, the wheel motors. We tell it uh, how many inches each rotation of the wheels are. We tell it to start moving straight. And then we tell it to repeat for 10 times, waiting two seconds, and then moving right, and then moving straight, and then waiting for two seconds. So it's, it's going to make a, uh, a series of right turns and then straight with two second pauses. And it's gonna do that for 10 times. And then it's gonna stop moving. Um, and then it's going to change the, the speed to minus 50%, which means move backwards, wait for three seconds, and then enter the uh, repeat forever loop and go straight for 12 rotations and then turn left for one rotation. And that robot will keep doing it until you either turn the robot off or we have a different event on the right. If the color sensor connected to A detects red while it's moving around, it'll issue a stop moving and it'll cause that repeat forever to stop doing what it was doing. This is an overly complicated program. There might be a case where your team members would need to do this, but it would be pretty uh, well into the season where they had a, a, a need this complicated. But now at least you know this, uh, this level of sophistication exists um, in the Scratch programming. You can actually tell it to do one thing uh, as soon as the program starts, and you can tell it to do other things based on other events, including sensor events, which we did touch on last night. Bruce, just a quick question. I'm not seeing in my EV3 classroom the set one, the set one motor rotation. Um, in oh, my yeah. very, very observant. That, okay. that is missing in the EV3. Um, I think it's maybe because of, of the uh, tradition of, of the EV3 uh, previous language didn't have it either. Uh, in both the earlier EV3 G language and the EV3 classroom, uh, instead of telling it the wheel circumferences, uh, the kids either need to do math on paper or have the program do some math where they, they know what the circumference is, they know how many inches or centimeters they want to go, and they divide uh, the number of inches by the circumference to get the number of rotations, including fraction, it might be 1.7, and then they tell it rotations. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Thank you. The cool thing about Spike Prime is you can you can cheat sort of by telling the program the circumference of your wheels, and then it'll do some of that math for you because you can tell it the distance you want, and it'll do the division for you. Okay. It's certainly an advantage to the fourth graders. Maybe maybe uh, it's better that the seventh graders figure it out on their own. And you said on the EV3 lessons um, website that it has a. a you you go of like a form where you can put in that information. You're like, right. this is the circumference of my exactly. wheel. Okay. And I, I put that uh, link to that on the wiki as well. And you'll you'll see it buried in, in uh, Monday's slide set. You'll see a link to that same page. The PDF. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Keep asking those questions. Um, oh, by the way, I don't have my. Uh, my chat box up. Let's see. It's empty, but I'll, I'll put it off to the side in case somebody wants to chat. Hopefully I'll see it. So if then else, um, or if then requires you to give it a condition, 
it gives you that hint by uh, having a trapezoid and you need to go find a trapezoid block to plug in there. Trapezoid blocks will always either be true or false. So when that particular thing you plug in uh, is true, it will do the blocks in, in the, that you plug in. If you have some, something else you want to do when it's false, and you use the if then else instead, uh, you put, plug the condition into the trapezoid, you plug the things you want done when it's true into the first part, and the things you want done when it's not true in the second part. So let's go look for an example. Uh, first, uh, let me touch on stop. We, we showed stop on a previous example. There are a bunch of different stops. You won't use them too often, but they're out there if you need them. You can tell it to stop all other stacks of blocks. You can tell it to stop all stacks. You can tell it to stop this stack. Oh, and you can tell it to stop all stacks and exit the program. Um, most programs you'll let uh, finish on their own by continuing down the sequence to the end but the stops are there uh, for extra flexibility. So now let's take a look at an if then else. Uh, here we tell it that the movement motors are B and C. Actually, that's not uh, too typical. It'd probably either be A and B or C and D uh, to uh, be symmetric on the top of the hub. But um, in uh, EV3, B and C is a common combination. Um, the, then we tell it the movement speed of 50%. And then we tell it to do something apparently forever. But uh, then we have an if that says, uh, if the uh, lights, the color sensor connected to port three on the front of the hub detects black, then change the speed to 25%, slow us down. So as soon as we find black, go to quarter speed instead of uh, half speed. Uh, but if it's not black, check to see if that same color sensor is detecting red. If it detects red, we're going to treat that as our stop line, and we're going to issue a stop and exit the program. So even though the, the repeat forever starts out being a forever, uh, one of the things that is done inside the loop can actually stop that loop by using the stop block. I prefer to use repeat until which uh, we'll feature tonight in a couple of different ways, but doing a forever and then having a stop condition is uh, equally legal. It's just less intuitive to me. Questions about this example? Please, Anne. Um, is it possible to see this in action? Like how it would translate to the robot? Um, yeah, this might be a good segue to uh, showing an EV3 program. So, so let me do a stop share and do a start share to wherever I stashed. Too many windows open again. There he is. So this is not the identical program, but it has some similarities. So uh, let's take a look at it. When the program starts, set the EV3 uh, uh, movement motors to B and C, which are uh, ports on the back of the hub, where I happen to have collect, uh, connected um, the motors, uh, the wheel motors on, on the EV3 that I'll show you in a minute. Set the movement speed to 25%. Um, Check to see if the touch sensor that's connected to the robot, see if I can show that on a screen. This is the touch sensor, the EV3 touch sensor right here. And when it's pressed, that uh, condition will become true. Um, and so that means that when it's not pressed, it will continue to use that if then else over and over again. And the if condition is, does the color sensor detect light intensity less than 60%? Here's the color sensor. It's going to bounce light off the mat. And if it's, there's a dark area, it'll be well under 60% um, and it will turn right. 
So if this sensor is on uh, gone to the left of the right edge of the road, it will detect dark and it'll uh, turn back towards the edge. Um, if it's greater than 60%, it's probably over the white to the right of the right edge of the road, and it wants to be at the edge, so it gradually turns left. In both cases, these are gradual turns. The maximum turn uh, in this language is 100, so 10 is a gradual right or left turn. So if it sees black, it and from above, if it sees black, uh, it will turn away from the road. Uh, if it sees white, it will turn towards the road to stay on the edge of the road. Um, it'll keep doing that until I reach down and push this sensor, which will cause the repeat condition to be, uh, become, the repeating tail condition to become true, and it'll quit the repeat and it'll do a stop moving. So that was complicated, but now we actually get to see it, especially if I switch webcams. So I'm going to stop to share, but you're, when I go back to programming, somebody's probably going to have to remind me to uh, go back to the programming environment or to a slide because I'm going to feature the webcam for a minute. There we are. So there's our robot. Here's the black road. I'm going to hold started out pretty close to the edge of the black road and let me double check and make sure it's on the right program yep i downloaded this program a few minutes ago and you'll see it gradually wiggle to stay on that road and it'll just keep going until i tell uh i push this button oops made a liar out of me Let's try that again. So we have a bug. one more time. So let's go see if we can find the bug. It worked uh, a couple of hours ago. So I'm going to uh, Go back to the program. Aha. The light sensor should be greater than. Uh, if it's dark, it should turn away from the road. I think that's the correct logic, but keep keep uh, thinking here. You might be right. First, I'm checking to make sure that I have that light sensor connected to port four, because if it's not on port four, it's not gonna work at all. Is the light sensor on your right or left of the robot? Yeah, it's on the right of the robot. Mm, okay. Oh, you can't see it. Here we go. Right there. Uh-huh. Uh, start moving right. So it'll kind of, if it if it gets to the white, it'll keep on going right, right? Um, if it gets off the road to the right, then it'll continue moving to the right. It well, won't... let's see. If if it's looping around here and it gets to the white, um, this will become false because white will reflect more than 60%. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So it's, I swear it worked earlier. So it's almost like I've got something unplugged.
Okay, so I'm going to stop the share to make that bigger. Henri Robot. Well, this is a good time to show you a debugging feature, but it's going to be really hard to do it on camera. So let, you're going to have to be real patient with me. Um, let's see. See the, the screen right here? Can you read that screen and when when I show hold it like that? It's uh, I just see the black line. I don't really see the content. Okay. Yeah, I was afraid of that. Okay. So you're gonna have to trust me a little bit. I'm, go I'm gonna go over to um, what's called a port view. And I'm gonna select port view and I'm gonna hold it up. I'm gonna select the sensor connected to number four, I'm going to hold it over white, and it's saying it's, re it's getting a 99% reading, and now I'm going to hold it over black, and it's getting a 4% reading. So that sensor it appears to be working uh, correctly, and our threshold is pretty much right in the middle there. So that's something to always check, uh, that port four is, is getting a correct light reading. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to X out of that. Go back to the program, put the webcam back to where hopefully you can see pretty well. Well, tonight it's decided to make a fool out of me, hasn't it? I'm going to try uh, re-downloading the program to make sure that's not the problem. Do a share screen. If there's any value of me wasting your time, it's to show you that when you run into a problem or the kids run into a problem, you have to be patient with yourself and diligent um, to figure out what's going on. Here, here's another display. It's telling us what the sensors are seeing. And it's saying that the light sensor is seeing 57%. If I hold it over the white edge. That's interesting. It's not changing. Why, why is the C a circle and the B a, like basically a square? Um, oh, that's a, a, a reference to the shape of the, of the motors. Um, so we have a different motor on C than we do on B? Oh, that's a hint. Uh, our because they should be paired, two. right? If they're able to equally turn right and left, they should be the same, same motor. Right. But let's go take a look. That's the bug. The motors are connected to A and B. No? It's detected the wrong motors. That's it. So when I booted it up, it incorrectly concluded that um, the, these motors, which are square, were uh, connected to A and B, when in fact they're connected to B and C. And the front motor that uh, connects this lever arm 
uh, it thinks is connected to C. So we're gonna need to power this down. So it'll take a couple of minutes to reboot. The uh, AV3 is notorious for being slow to boot. First, it, it takes about five seconds to, to shut down. So that I'm I'm gonna guess if we can get this synchronized right, it'll uh, it'll show the square motors connected to B and C and the round motor connected to A. And can the uh, spike provide like a similar, uh, like kind of heads up display as the EV3? Yes, yes, it has a, a very similar display, just the difference in the, in the details of the, the motors and sensors. Perfect. So uh, in an ironic sort of way, uh, the adversity is, is helping us find tricks of the trade. Okay, I'm rebooting it. You can see the red light is on. Eventually it'll make a turtle noise. Okay, uh, meanwhile, Colette asks, uh, can I repeat how I got this? So let me, when I'm in the app, uh, the screen may look like this, the home screen. And when you first start, you won't have all these different programs because I've added them. But you can see here where it says new project. If I click on new project, it gives me a blank screen with just one yellow block, which I can make bigger. And then I can start dragging other blocks in and plugging them in. I need to connect to the robot. Um, the first time it takes a while because you have to do a Bluetooth pairing and you have to type one, two, three, four on the, on the, uh, the, the front of, of the robot, I think, or anyway, one of those Bluetooth things, but this has already been paired. So now it's, it's showing it's paired, it's showing my program I just threw together. Now let's go look and see, look at that. It now correctly knows that the wheel motors are in B and C and the uh, front motor is on A. So it's gonna behave correctly now. It was giving uh, the wrong voltages to the motors because it was confused about where they were plugged in. The, uh, my program was correctly uh, trying to give voltage to B and C, but it, uh, it on the, uh, particularly on the EV3, it's very sensitive to whether it knows which type of motor is in which port. So I'm gonna predict the same program that I had before is now gonna work. I'm gonna go back to home. I'm gonna click on that program, get it back. Uh, just for completeness, I'm gonna re-download it. Now I'm gonna to stop to share and I'm gonna select that program. It's selected. And the same program should now work. There, see it wiggling, following the road? But it, it gets carried away because I didn't reach down and hit the stop. So I'll set it down again. Following the road, I reached down and I hit stop. So the program exits when I get there. Let's go back and take a look at the program. Repeat until the touch sensor connected to port one is pressed. Pretty cool, that's how it stopped it. That's not gonna be realistic of how it would work on a first Lego league playing field, um, unless you had maybe a mechanism uh, that would trigger that button when it got to the two by four wall. So maybe the kids will design something that triggers the touch sensor that causes it to stop when it gets to a, to a wall, and then it goes on to doing something else. That might be a powerful way to, for it to know that it's reached the end of the playing field or one of the sides of the playing field. But 
I'm going to switch sensors now. I'm going to drag this block in, which I prepared earlier. And I happen to know that this ultrasonic sensor is cabled back around to port three. And so I've my condition for repeating, it, uh, stop repeating, repeat until the ultrasonic sensor connected to port three detects a distance from a wall or the equivalent of five centimeters. Now I could go get a two by four or two by six uh, from a uh, project I'm working on and I could put it over here, but instead I'm gonna use my hand. It's gonna detect my hand without it touching my hand. It's gonna stop when it uh, gets to five centimeters from my hand. That could have been a wall though. Now, the change I just made is not in the robot. So I'm going to go down and download it. It made a twirling noise that's now in the robot. Double check that it's still on the right program. Yep, still on that program. This button is no longer going to be the thing that's going to stop it. It's going to when I put my hand out. So here we go. Uh, you got to switch to the, oh, there we go. Yeah, let me stop the share to give you a bigger image. Do it again. Get, get me honest on this stuff. Here we go again. So once it got within five centimeters of my hand, it stopped. So you can see that'd be pretty useful too. Uh, rather than uh, running into the wall, it used the distance sensor to find the wall in advance of getting there. And you get to decide what the condition is. So let's go back to our slides for a few minutes at the risk of uh, having less fun. So we, we did see an example of if then else, uh, we used a sensor, but was, wasn't exactly this program. We use the repeat until uh, in the example we just did. Uh, so let's examine a, a, a somewhat different program. Set the motor speed to 50%, set the movement motors to C and D, repeat uh, until the color sensor connected to port A detects red. Um, start moving straight wait for two seconds, start moving right, wait for 1.5 seconds, and then check for red again. So it's going to make this weird zigzag movement. Uh, and hypothetically, eventually by uh, going straight and then right, straight and then right, eventually it's gonna find red. It's, that's the re repeat and tell condition. And it's going to leave this loop and stop moving. Uh, it might do something else. Maybe that means that it, it needs to turn right and go to a particular thing on the first Lego league playing field. Maybe it needs to retrieve something, grab something, push something, pull something, lift something once it's gotten to that red line. So here's another example. Um, set the uh, motors uh, to C and D, start moving straight, uh, wait, wait. Now we're using a wait. The wait is equivalent to repeat until where we give it nothing to do in the repeat until. So it's a shorthand for that, but you can just think of it as, as a separate thing. Uh, the program does nothing or loops doing nothing uh, or put more succinctly, it waits until uh, the color sensor connected to A detects red, and then it executes the next block. In the meantime, the robot was moving straight ahead. You can also nest these blocks. Um, we nested a repeat and an if then else before. In this example, we've got repeat 10, an if condition that's not completely fleshed out, but we could add more blocks in here, a repeat forever. Uh, inside that, there's a repeat for 10, uh, then an if, and then after it finishes the if, it waits for a condition. So I'm not sure what all these blocks are actually trying to do, 
but you can uh, nest them in arbitrary ways at the risk of getting so much complexity the human mind can't follow it anymore. Um, but it's a pretty powerful programming language. So here's another example. When the program starts, set the movement speed to 50%, set the movement motors to B and C. Um, this, this must be spike prime because it, it's got this set one motor rotation to three inches. I don't know of any wheels that are three inches, so you'd want to ch uh, choose an actual circumference of the wheels. Um, start moving straight, then repeat forever. If the uh, center connected D, uh, that's the touch center connected D is pressed, then stop moving. That'd be similar to what I did in that other program. It stopped the, uh, the loop when I uh, touched that sensor. But if the touch sensor isn't, connected, uh, isn't pressed, it checks one other thing. It says, is the amount of light currently reflected uh, into the sensor connected to A darker than 50%? If so, stop moving. So under two conditions, it will stop moving. Um, and until one of those things happens, it will keep moving straight. Not sure exactly why we want to do that, uh, but we're, I'm going to give you a more realistic example in a minute. Last time we uh, briefly used some event blocks. These start new sequences of blocks based on a condition. We saw that uh, case where when it was red, the red event caused us to stop the forever loop in the other stack. I don't use these very often because usually in first Lego League, you wanted to do something, then do something else, then do something else. You wanted to do sequentially. If you set up a bunch of these independent events, uh, you don't know what's going to occur first, second, and third. It gets very confusing very quickly. A powerful multitasking feature, but uh, not recommended for um, beginners. Last time we took a look at all the different things that sensors can do. Here's the spike prime uh, true false from the sensors and the spike prime uh, things that return numbers from the sensors. Um, and the next slide shows us very similar uh, blue blocks. Um, so these can be plugged into those weight uh, blocks. They can be plugged into the repeat until blocks. They can be plugged into the if then or the if then else blocks because all of these produce true or false values and can be used with those flow controls that we're talking about tonight. Next time we'll do math and we'll be able to use these values. These all return a value that can be used in a comparison or in a calculation. And we'll get into that next time. Uh, but here's a foreshadow of that, where we've got uh, logic blocks that can take two other true false values and create something new, or they can take um, numbers and create true false values. And you can nest those. Here's a homework you can do that'll be in the, uh, PDF that I'll send you tonight or more likely tomorrow morning. And more homework. Tomorrow we'll get into data. So let me stop the share and let's go back to doing some real programming. I'm going to restart a share, but this time we'll use Spike Prime. So I need to go find it. You can't see my share screen, but it's there. There's Spike Prime. And now in a second, you should see that. Nope, try again. I managed to confuse Zoom. Start share. There we go. Sorry for the delay. I don't know where, where I got lost. So I'm going to start a, a new project. And hopefully I, I won't go too crazy about creating a brand new program. I'll do it, use it, word blocks, and I'll say create. It'll give me a blank screen with a, a tiny when program starts. Um,
And I'm going to make that bigger by hitting the uh, magnifying glass at the bottom. Make it easy for you folks to see it on your end. I'm going to give the project a new name by clicking on the three dots and clicking on rename. And I guess I can give it today's date, uh, similar to what we did a couple of days ago. Today's date is the 8th. Save it under that name. Now I'm going to go to the movement blocks. Since I'm using Sprite Prime, I'm going to pick three of them. I'm going to say 50% speed. A and B is not correct. Uh, let me show you a trick here. I can change this to C and D, which is correct for my robot. But let me show you a neat trick. I throw this one away, turn on my Spike Prime, which I think you can see in the small webcam. It boots real fast compared to the EV3. Um, it's now booted. Now I can connect to it. It goes out and finds three possibilities. The one I want, it's called New Hub. And it's connected. So I can X out of that screen. Now, if I go grab this very same block, it does me the favor and it's figured out that my, my uh, I'm most likely talking about C and D because I've got motors connected to C and D. I've got a, a third motor connected to E, but it knows that that's the larger motor. It guesses correctly that the two medium motors are the, probably the ones that are connected to wheels. Now, if it guessed incorrectly, I would just click here and I would tell it what I thought was true. But C and D is correct for this particular robot. So sometimes the robot figures these things out. Um, this block in Spike Prime assumes you're using the wheels I am using. If I use the bigger wheels that come in the expansion set, I'd need to change this. But 17.5 centimeters in diameter is correct. Now I'm going to tell it to start moving. Straight. And then I'm going to put it into a loop. So I'm going to go to the a shortcut to the control box is this dot here. I could also get it by scrolling down. But if I click here, it'll scroll down for me. And I'm going to give it a repeat until. And I'm going to say I want to repeat until the right sen uh, the left sensor detects black. So I'm going to go get a color sensor. And I'm going to use reflected light rather than the actual the color black. Um, less than fifty percent is probably good. Uh, where is my color sensor? The the right the left sensor is connected to A, so that's just an accident that it guessed that correctly. So I'm going to do something until the left sensor, uh, this one here, detects black. And in fact, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm up to here. It's going to probably, if I if it stays in the middle road, it's going to see white. 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 But when it gets down to here, it's going to see the black of that left turning road, and it'll make a decision. So I'm going to use the left sensor to detect the turn in the road. Now I'm going to put an if that and else in. So I need to go back to my control box and get the if then else. And I'm going to make this one conditional on the right center, which is very similar to what we did with our EV3 a few minutes ago, except I'm building this from scratch. And hopefully, it'll work better the first time than the other one did when it got so confused about its motors. Glad we figured that out with the help of one of you who noticed the odd thing on the screen. So back to the sensor blocks. 
I want another reflected light to put in here, but I want it connected to B because I've got my right color sensor connected to B right there. It, it knows there is a color sensor there and it's giving me that icon if you can see that. And I wanna make a decision based on whether that's less than 50%. And if it's dark, then it's over the road and I wanna go slightly right, similar to what I did on EV3. So I go back to movements and I select, start moving right but I don't want it to do the 30%. I want to do a 10%, similar to the EV3. Well, let's say 15, that might be good. But if it's less than, uh, if it's not less than 50%, it's more than 50%. The else case then is relatively bright, which means it's over the white part and it needs to lean left to go slightly left to get back on the edge of the road. So I grab that same block again, it defaults to right. Right is not what I want. I want left. So I drag this over until I get to left 15%, which is also notice it says left minus 15%. So it's using uh, negative to mean left. But I plugged it into the wrong place. I want it in the else case. So I grab it out of there and plug it into the else case. When it finally finds that turn in the road, I want it to go a little bit farther. So I'm going to say, move another four centimeters and then make a left turn in place for nine centimeters. I need to say turn in place to the left. That's what that icon is, and then nine. Nine, it just happens to be a good number for turn in place, nine centimeters is approximately a left turn. Now, last night we learned that we could also use the gyro to control that more precisely. So if we have extra time tonight, I can replace this left turn with a gyro control left turn of 90 degrees. But for simplicity, this will be our program. So let's read our program. Set the movement motors to C and D. Uh, set one rotation to 17 and a half centimeters, which is what we believe our wheels circumference to be. Start moving straight ahead and re repeat this loop until the left color sensor connected to A detects dark. And in the loop, anytime the right color sensor detects dark, move a little bit to the right. But when it's not detecting dark, move a little bit to the left. So it should wiggle on the edge of the right edge of the road until finally that left sensor detects the turn of the road, in which case it'll go another four centimeters and then make a sharp left turn. None of this is in the robot. So now we need to put it in the robot. I need to drag a window over here. So I, my chat window is covering that up. You can't see that. I'm going to put it in slot zero. Download. Still downloading. Match finished. Uh, I'm going to stop the share. Hopefully you can see this if I hold it up to the webcam. If I push the right button here, it'll go to zero. If I go too far, I'm going to get one of the programs from last night or the night before. So I want zero because that's where I just put the program. Then I'm going to set it down approximately on the edge of the road and tell it to go. Not bad. We had 50% speed. That was pretty fast, but it detected that turn in the road. So let's go back to the program. And if I can find the same program. 
This is where we left off. Now I'm going to tell it to go another 17 centimeters, which I think is what I measured earlier to be the distance to where the yellow cat is. And then I'm going to tell it to turn right at the cat. Uh, Anne asked, can the students measure the wheels? Um, in Spike Prime, they could potentially Google to find out that the, the wheels I'm using are 17 and a half. Um, and the other wheels, I'd have, have to Google to find them, or maybe that's buried in, in, on, Le on the Lego site. Um, but they could use a, a regular tape measure, like I showed you last night, to measure the diameter and then multiply that by 3.14 to get the circumference. Um, particularly if it's EV3, where they need to make, uh, make the calculations themselves. But um, if they're using the bigger wheels from the expansion set, they need to know that circumference. Or they can use a, uh, a seamstress tape measure and wrap it around the outside of the wheels to get the circumference. Um, and then depending on whether they're using spike prime, they either tell the program the answer or they use it in a calculation. So for a right turn, I'm going to uh, turn nine centimeters to the right. And let's see if I can drag this up. Yep. And plug it at the bottom. And then download this to the robot. And then stop to share. Did I download it? I don't remember. I think I did. Yeah, I did. Okay, here we go. Wiggles, finds the left turn, makes the left turn. And that was approximately where the hideout is, okay? And those turns were, were not bad at all. But trust me that if you did that enough times with that very uh, um, tightness of the wheels, friction of the mat, um, uh, battery charges, it would not always turn exactly 90 degrees each time. So let's try replacing uh, that 90 degree turn with a gyro control turn to get more precision, more predictability. So we're gonna go back and to that program. How are we doing on time? Got a few minutes left. I'm going to fix, change the, the, the left turn at the turn of the road, toss that block out. I'm going to tell it to start moving instead of telling it for sen, sen, uh, nine centimeters. I'm going to just say start moving to the left. And then I'm going to put in a weight. Not wait for one second, wait for a condition. So that's a wait until. And then I'm going to go look for a sensor block that uses the gyro. And it says pitch angle. but I change that to yaw because that's left and right. Then I need to do some math. So I'm gonna go over uh, to the operator blocks. The math blocks are green. Um, and I, in this case, I wanna compare that yaw angle to 
Now it's going to be a little tough on the fourth graders, but a left turn is minus 90. And so I I'm looking for uh, a number that's less than 89, minus 89. So it's going to start the left turn and it's uh, immediately the angle will start becoming negative, negative one, negative two, uh, you know, very rapidly, it's just turning. Uh, eventually, the yaw angle will become less than negative 89. So if I were you, if I was teaching the kids this, I would probably start with a right turn because that'll be positive numbers, right? A uh, clockwise turn will be uh, positive and you can uh, use greater than like we did last night. Uh, but in this case, left turn is going to be a negative number. It's going to wait until it gets to less than 89. And we could say stop moving, but if we replug these blocks in, it'll implicitly stop that left turn and move straight for 17 centimeters. And I'm going to boost this up to five centimeters to see if it's a little bit closer to the center of the road when it makes that turn. And I didn't tell it to reset the yaw angle. Uh, so I better do that. I'm gonna go back to sensors and get the special block that says the yaw angle to zero before the turn starts. Otherwise the yaw angle will be wherever, uh, whatever it was when I powered the robot on, which is probably not what I wanted. I downloaded it, I'm gonna to stop to share. Should be bigger on some of your screens now. And I'm gonna hit start. Well, that left turn was a little bit questionable, but in the end, the right turn ended up pretty being nicely at right angles. So if we were trying to re uh, rescue this cat, and had another half an hour, uh, we would have it line follow using one of the two color sensors. So it would stay in the center of the road and then make a gyro control right turn. This would be up. It would then move forward a certain number of centimeters and then actuate this arm, grab the cat, back up, turn left, back up, turn left, and take the cat home. So that'd be at least another half an hour of programming. Uh, now, is that part of this year's first Lego League challenge? No, but that's the kind of thing that the kids need to do to make points um, each year, uh, depending on what the various missions are in the first Lego League uh, giant map. So uh, we'll continue this discussion tomorrow, but uh, let me... I'm, I can switch cameras at will, but for a moment, I'm going to put myself on the screen and ask if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Ann. Um, so Bruce, a lot of these um, preliminaries, at least, just to kind of understand movements and how to stack blocks and that kind of thing are in our software as practices, is that right? Um, you can get, get there in a couple of different ways. There, um, Lego education has put lessons in and uh, in Spike Prime, the lessons, um, there's a set of lessons. I, uh, I'll, I'll quickly show that uh, by a screen share. And there's equivalent uh, stuff available in the EBQ classroom, I just haven't used it as much. If I go back to home, there's being very sluggish because Zoom is slowing it down. There we go. Um, and if I say units, it's got, uh, and this one down here, if I scroll down, is called competition ready. Those are the ones, the lessons that are most relevant, the first Lego League. And it'll take the kids through training camp one, two, and three to learn some of the stuff that we did differently tonight. 
uh, so we can slow down on this and get more of these. So that would be one thing to do. The other thing you can do is on the ORTOP wiki, there are a set of lessons to use this mat. Um, and uh, you can print the mat at your local print shop for about $30. Uh, there's also a set of, of YouTube videos that use a larger uh, hand-drawn mat. And you can just have the kids watch that and, and learn some of those techniques.